applause, but I got it. <laughs> peace, peace, peace oh. brother Ron. It's a pleasure yeah, to hear. Him, and it's a pleasure to follow my brother, uh, Tenicio, also. It's interesting how kind of the community of people doing this work is kind of small, even though we're in different places, we're all connected together. So, um, you know, give thanks to all the people who are doing this work across the country uh, and all, all the folks who are struggling for black sovereignty in general, food sovereignty and black sovereignty in general. Um, and also, as Brother Tenesio said, uh, congratulations, Brother Duran, and, and big ups for maintaining the uh, Happily Natural Festival for 18 years. Thank you. Uh, one of the challenges we have in our community is that a lot of us don't have longevity. You know, this uh, business of building black institutions and black organizations is a protracted work. It doesn't happen in, you know, six months. And sometimes people get into something, get frustrated and give up uh, and go back to, you know, kind of the mainstream or whatever. So, I mean, it's a tremendous testimony that you've been doing this for 18 years and that kind of longevity and dedication is what it takes to build black institutions. So I, I commend you. I'm proud to be your brother and your comrade, and I'm proud to be uh, with you today on the on the festival, the virtual festival. So um, I always, you know, begin by giving praise to the Creator and by acknowledging our ancestors, uh, both those that we share collectively um, and those who are in my own personal bloodline. And I continue to draw inspiration from both. And I'm glad Brother Tenesio mentioned. Uh, George Washington Carver, who we consider to be the patron saint of organic agriculture. And so being able to connect with our ancestors and knowing that we're just a link in the chain, that we're really not doing anything new, but we're continuing a historical struggle uh, is important. It's important to stay grounded within that. It, help keeps, it helps to keep us humble because we're really not creating anything new. You know, if we look back a hundred years ago, we see black folks organizing around farming and around self-reliance. So we're not doing anything new. So acknowledging our ancestors keeps us humble and keeps us as part of this larger uh, paradigm, both seen and unseen that we're a part of. I also wanna acknowledge uh, my brothers and sisters and comrades in the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And although I'm the primary spokesperson for the group, that doesn't mean that I'm the one primarily doing the work. We have lots of people who are putting in sweat equity to move forward the programs of our organization. And you might not see their faces as much, but they are just as much a part and as important to our organization as any other member. And so I wanna acknowledge them and uh, also point out that I think it's really important that we're part of an organization. You know, a lot of times black folks run from organized structures because it's hard to work in concert with each other in an organization. It points out our own deficiencies we become impatient with sometimes the shortcomings in others, but the only way that we can move forward working against systemic oppression is for us to do it in an organized manner. And so I wanna acknowledge the organization I'm a part of and encourage others to be part of an organization uh, wherever you live uh, that's doing work that's aligned with your values. I also wanna acknowledge my brothers and sisters and comrades in the National Black Food and Justice Alliance and we in the Alliance realize that the problems that face black people in Detroit are very similar to the problems that face black people in Richmond, are very similar to the problems that face black people in Atlanta or Brooklyn or wherever we might happen to be inside the United States. And also we have similar problems to black people throughout the world. Uh, and definitely, Duran, I'm rooted in the Pan-Africanist view. Uh, as Malcolm X said, we have to internationalize our struggle. And so we need to be identifying Black folks in the Caribbean and South America, Central America, Africa, who are also struggling for Black food sovereignty. So the National Black Food and Justice Alliance is a formation of organizations and individuals of Black people from throughout the United States who are doing work in two major areas. One bucket of work we call Black Land and Power, and the second bucket of work we call Self-Determining Food Economies. And so we are building slowly, step by step, this national uh, formation in order to foster cooperation between our people in various parts of the country and all in order to share knowledge and skills related to farming, related to administration, related to fund development, and all of the kind of things that we need to do to build institutions that are part of a sovereign Black uh, food system. Um, 
I also think it's important whenever anybody talks to you to kind of know what is that person's background, you know, because these days with Instagram and YouTube, we have a lot of instant black leaders, folks that, as far as I can see, popped up from somewhere and have no traceable history. Um, and so I think it's important that we know, you know, what, what is the person's background? Who did they study with? What organizations that they were in? So I wanna just provide a little bit of my background to get some context to the remarks I'm gonna make. And I'll start by saying um, that I was born in 1956, I'm 64 years old. And I tell my age because it can help to place a person within a particular era of time and era in history, if you know when they were born and when they came of age. And so I largely came of age in the late 1960s. And I'm sure most people uh, viewing this know that the 60s was a period of tremendous turbulence, uh, rebellion, and uh, had the potential for revolution. Um, and so in 1967, Detroit had the largest of the urban rebellions that occurred in the United States. I was 11 years old at that time. I remember it vividly. It had a profound impact on me, as did the period immediately following that rebellion. So in 1969, I was 13 years old. I was sitting in my eighth grade social studies class and a teacher played Malcolm X's message to the grassroots. And frankly, I haven't been the same since. He also played Jimi Hendrix's Band of Gypsies, which started me playing guitar, which I've been playing since that time. So in many ways, the trajectory that I'm on now began in 1969, uh, 50, uh, 51 years ago. So. Since that time, I've been both a student activist in high school and in college. Um, and for 22 years, I ran an African-centered school in Detroit in Sodoma Institute. I've been involved in many organizations that have worked uh, for the release of political prisoners, organizations that have done prisoner support work, taking children to prisons and family to prisons to visit their loved ones. We put out a, a prison re-entry manual for brothers and sisters coming out of the joint, coming back into the community. Uh, we've been involved in many efforts to eradicate drugs in our community, to uh, efforts for against police brutality, all kinds of efforts to create justice for our people and to foster self-determination. And so the work I'm currently doing in food, for me, is an extension of the larger work within the Black Liberation Movement. So I didn't come to this work uh, as a result of, you know, of, of reading Michael Pollan's book, for example, you know, or come, come to this work uh, because I read, you know, a book about veganism. But really, I came to this work because for me, it's an extension of the Black liberation movement. And the reality is that liberation is unthinkable, unspeakable, if we can't feed ourselves. Uh, we have lots of different philosophies in the Black community. And oftentimes we find ourselves divided by these philosophies. Some folks might be with the nation of gods and earth. Some folks might be with the nation of Islam. Some folks might be Rastafari. Some folks might be Sunni Muslim. Some folks might be, you know, identify with various belief systems that exist within our community. And often those things become a barrier to us uniting and doing the kind of collective work that we need to survive and move forward. And so one of the things that, that we found is that regardless of what of those belief systems you might adhere to, one of the things that we can agree on and that we all have in common is the fact that we have to eat and that part of being self-reliant as a community is being able to feed ourselves. And so this is an essential step in our process towards becoming self-reliant and becoming sovereign. No matter what your belief system is, if white people and Arabs are feeding you, then we're in a dependent situation. And so, I'm very concerned, as are many of our, our people in our communities throughout the country, with how we break the yoke of white supremacy, particularly in terms of what goes into our stomachs and how we become more self-reliant and also how we capture some of the food dollars that are generated from producing the food that we eat. So I mentioned um, that I'm a member, in fact, I'm executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And I want to tell you a bit about that organization. Uh, we started really in many ways as an outgrowth of the work that we were doing at the African Center School that I served as director of. That school is called Ensortima Institute. 
And in fact, uh, this that I wear around my neck is the Adinkra symbol in Sodoma, which literally means star. And the proverb that goes along with it is, I shine not by my own light, but my light is a reflection of the creators. And so this is the name of the school that I was affiliated with for uh, more than two decades. So in 1999, we started doing serious gardening at the school with the children and developed the food security curriculum. That continued to grow. We started having parents at the school that said, I want to garden in my yard or in the vacant lot next to my house. So we created something called the Shamba Organic Garden Collective, where we had about 20 gardens throughout the city of Detroit. And we would go out on Saturday mornings and collectively work to prepare those gardens. So that energy continued to grow so that by 2006, we had to create a larger container to hold the work. And we created what we now know as the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. So since that time, we've done several things, including uh, writing the city of Detroit's food security policy, along with input from others, but we stewarded that process. We also were the lead organization in creating the Detroit Food Policy Council. We operate D-Town Farm, which is a seven acre farm, the largest farm in the city of Detroit. We have a youth program called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program, which is at two sites in the city right now for young people between the ages of seven and 12. We teach them uh, uh, how to build and maintain raised beds and how to uh, be food justice advocates in their community. Uh, we, are, we have a huge project we're working on called the Detroit Food Commons. We're building a building, a $15 million building, two stories, the, the uh, bottom floor of which will be the Detroit People's Food Co-op, a cooperatively owned grocery store. And so um, that is a huge project and in many ways will be a game changer in the city of Detroit. Um, also, as a result of the COVID pandemic, we've shifted some of our activities. Normally, we have lots and lots of volunteers at our farm, but we've limited volunteers because of the pandemic. And, and also, we have a lot of people who come to our farm to learn urban agriculture by working side by side with us. Since that wasn't possible in the ways that it's been possible in the past, we shifted strategy. And this year, we created a seed sharing program where we distributed seeds to community members and we also put together a series of four video tutorials talking about the basics of gardening. And then we partnered with Okibalan Village, another local community organization to provide raised beds and topsoil to 100 families in Detroit. So what we're really trying to do is kind of decentralize this work. So we don't, instead of having a lot of people come to D-Town Farm, we're encouraging people to do this in smaller units on a smaller scale with fewer people that they can actually control. And we've seen a tremendous growth in the interest in urban agriculture, food co-ops and the like as a result of both the pandemic and a result of the protests that have followed the police murder of George Floyd. Um, so I wanna shift to a PowerPoint presentation. And Brother Duran, do I have a screen sharing capability right yeah. now? Yeah, you, should, you should be able to share your screen uh, no problem. Uh, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to uh, pull up a PowerPoint, which is called Food, Race, and Justice. Can you see my screen? I can see you. It says, thank you, Malik Yakini. Oh, oh, yeah, we're at the end of it. Sorry. Okay, let me... Uh, let me get back to the beginning. Okay, great, great, great. So this is in fact a picture at D-Town Farm, uh, kind of right near our front gate. And we have a pretty large operation. Um, it can be daunting sometimes working out there because of the scale of what we're doing, but we were determined to do it on a fairly large scale to kind of model what can actually be done. So I really want to start my story uh, today by talking about my great grandfather and because um, I want to make this personal. So my mother's grandfather, Sandy Shepard Odom, was born in Mississippi in 1863, two years before chattel slavery ended. And somehow miraculously, um, by the early 1880s, he was in uh, Arkansas and had become a state legislator. 
Uh, he lived in a town called Marion, Arkansas, which is 40 miles west of Memphis. He was a farmer. Um, and in Marion, Black folks have basically taken control of the political apparatus. Most of the elected political officials were Black people. So in 1888, the good white people of Marion, Arkansas, decided they had had enough of these Black folks uh, kind of running things. And they came up with a, a, a pretense for doing this. But what they did is they gathered the Black leadership of the town at gunpoint and ran them out of town in, at gunpoint. There's accounts of people being run into swamps. There's accounts of people being forced onto trains at gunpoint. And the written account that I've seen of this is by the American Missionary, uh, the October 1888 issue. And they mentioned my grandfather in particular, uh, Sandy Shepherd Odom living on his farm about six miles uh, west, uh, six miles from Marion. Um, I am informed refused to leave his home when waited upon in order to go. Uh, he said, all I have here is here, my wife, child, and farm, I can't go away. And so he stood, he withstood the pressure of this armed mob for a while, but I guess eventually after some days decided that to save his life and the life of his family, he would leave. And so he also left, he wound up in a place called Brinkley, Arkansas, where he actually built a school. And this is how I first became interested in this ancestor because of my having run a school and realizing that this was not my idea at all, but it was really ancestral compulsion. And so even in spite of having to walk away from the farm that he owned and getting nothing for it, there was no compensation, uh, he still was able to rebuild his life and still be an asset to his community. You know, I often think about how both in this case and the case of the thousands of other people that this happened to, what, how our situation would be different now if they had not been run off their land? How would my family situation have been different if my great grandfather had been able to retain this land that he purchased? You know, he would have had uh, more well, wherewithal and more wealth to pass down to, to his son, my grandfather, which could have been passed down to my mother and passed down to me. So the situation we're in today as a people is directly related to history. You know, we can't erase what happened because it has a direct relationship to our status today. And clearly black folks being run off the land at gunpoint is one of the major reasons that we have food insecurity in black communities because we've been divested of land, which is really the basis of producing food. So I mentioned already the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Uh, the picture on the uh, left side of the screen is our rainwater retention pond at D-Town Farm. The picture on the right is uh, a young lady in our Food Warriors Youth Development Program with some garlic that the young people grew. And actually that year, the garlic the young people grew was more robust than the garlic that the adults grew at D-Town Farm. So what we want is for our young people to surpass us. And in that case, that was definitely the case. So I mentioned we're members of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. And I know Deron, they've uh, been in touch with you, but Brother Randolph, I don't know if you're a member yet, yeah. but great. So uh, we just want folks to check the website out, www.blackfoodjustice.org. And uh, this organization is open to black organizations and black individuals. And so uh, check it out. You know, our platform, what we stand for is on the website. Uh, you can see if you're aligned with it. And if so, you can fill out the information form and we will get back with you. So I wanna talk a bit about what sometimes we call the industrial food system. Um, the United States is clearly one of the wealthiest countries in the world and produces huge amounts of food, particularly since the period after World War II uh, with the advent of what some people call the Green Revolution. Uh, this guy named Norman Burlog was, was trying to figure out how the United States could produce huge quantities of food. And so he really created a style of farming which has come to define agriculture in the post-World War II period in the United States. And that style of farming is heavily dependent upon large machinery, upon the use of large amounts of pesticides and fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, and also dependent upon having huge amounts of water. 
uh, none of which are sustainable. And, and many of those things are also harmful to the environment. So interestingly, even though the United States produces huge amounts of food, it also imports huge amounts of food from other countries. So uh, as I mentioned, these mechanisms for producing this large amount of food are not only harmful to the environment, but they're also harmful to human health and they promote uh, inequitable access to high quality food and they concentrate ownership in the, land, in the hands of a few. Uh, the style of agriculture developed uh, in, since World War II relies heavily, as I mentioned, on chemically produced fertilizers and pesticides. Those chemicals often leach into groundwater that in turn empties into streams, rivers, and lakes. And so what you're seeing there in the picture is a picture from 2014. That's an algae bloom in Lake Erie. And this is caused primarily by excess nitrogen being in the water from agricultural runoff. So the city of Toledo had to ban people from drinking water from the public water uh, system that year. <coughs> Excuse me, because of this algae bloom. So, um, so this is the use of the chemicals is polluting, polluting the water. Uh, the use of the heavy machinery uh, is de uh, depleting, uh, depleting topsoil at about 10 times the rate that the earth can naturally reproduce it. And so clearly, if we continue down this path, humanity in general is in for a disaster because we won't have arable land in order to produce high quality food. Um, then the other problem with this industrial food system is it transports food huge amounts, of huge numbers of miles. So in the United States on average, food is transported 1500 miles from where it's produced to where it's consumed. And the transportation of that food puts huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. So there's a relationship between what people eat and their concepts of class and status and things like that. And you know, I can remember as a child, although most days we ate at home and you know, my mother cooked and we had you know, relatively whole foods, although you know, we had lots of canned foods during that time period, but so-called fast food was seen as being kind of a treat and kind of something special. And I guess if you had a few disposable dollars with it, you could spend on that, then somehow you felt like you had arrived. And so we see this throughout the world that people striving for Western standards of what they think is status begin to adopt this uh, Western style diet, which some people call the standard American diet or SAD. And so this diet prom promotes the consumption of heavily processed convenience foods with excessive amounts of refined sugars, uh, meat and dairy. And it's responsible for rates of uh, very high rates of childhood and adult obesity, diabetes and heart disease. And clearly these diseases appear more frequently in communities that lack access to high quality food, which of course uh, definitely includes black and brown communities. So there's many intersecting factors that cause this inequitable access to high quality food in America, including geography and economic class. But one of the huge factors is racism. Uh, there continues to be a global system of white supremacy that gives favor and unearned privilege to people who are ident identified as white. It makes white people the norm and marginalizes the experiences of African people and other people of color. And it creates structural barriers to equity. So this is, there's many definitions of uh, white supremacy. This is one that I think is a good definition uh, that was put out by a group called Dismantling Racism Works, so DR Works. And they have an anti-racist handbook that they do when they have trainings. They say that white supremacy is the idea that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. The global system of white supremacy is anchored in a worldview that suggests that white people are the best thing since sliced bread. This Eurocentric view causes people throughout the world to be falsely taught that Greece and Rome are the fountainheads of human civilization, that classical culture is synonymous with Western European culture, and that so-called Jesus, Mary, and presumably God 
are all white. In much of the world, we continue to name the days of the week after ancient European deities such as Wooden and Thor. Race is not a scientific reality. Race is a social and political construct, and at very times it's been bolstered by pseudoscience, religion, and the military. The concept of racial identity has evolved throughout the history of the United States. An early American definition of whiteness was that an individual did not have one drop of black or Native American blood. Conversely, in the 19th century, in Southern law, it was determined that one drop of black blood made you a so-called Negro. Even though race is not a scientific reality, as a social construct, it continues to impact every major institution and system in American society, including the food system. If it's true that land is the basis of all power, then land ownership in America tells a profound story about race and power. In 1910, Blacks owned 15 million acres of farmland. By 1992, that number had dropped to 2 million acres. According to the USDA's Agriculture Economics Land Ownership Survey of 1999, of all privately owned land, agricultural land, whites own 98% of the acreage, Blacks, Native Americans, Latinx, and Asians collectively own only 2%. But this land grabbing, which by the way is really the basis of American society, uh, doesn't just happen in rural areas, it also happens in urban areas. And so in urban areas, particularly where we have large black populations, we're seeing gentrification and we're seeing play out the logic of capitalism. And what I mean by that is, for example, I live in Detroit, which may well be the blackest city in America. We still have probably 80% of the population being black folks. But, you know, we hear a lot about the comeback of Detroit coming back from bankruptcy. But what we're seeing is development, which is led by wealthy white men. And then we're supposed to see that as progress because we can walk into these edifices that they build and we can spend our money and be consumers. So the logic of capitalism says that if you need to go to the bank and borrow a million dollars and make no mistake, developers are not coming out of their own pockets to pay for developments like what you see in this photograph. They're getting loans and really spending other people's money to do that. And so that's just how it's done in America. Very few people have enough cash that they can just put cash up to do some kind of development. And so the logic of capitalism is that if you go to the bank to borrow a million dollars, you already have to have a million dollars or something worth a million dollars or somebody to sign for you who has a million dollars because the bank wants to make sure if you default on the loan, they're going to be able to get their money. And so what that means is that the people who are almost always the one, ones who are eligible to get this funding are already wealthy white men. So we're seeing white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy all play out in the development of places like the so-called development of places like Detroit and cities throughout the United States. The thing is that this logic of capitalism is self-replicating and unless we break the cycle, we'll continue to see white people dominating in our communities. The reality is that there can be no food justice without land reform. And this is a picture of Eddie Wise, who was a North Carolina farmer who in 2016 was evicted from his farm uh, as a result of years of uh, injustice on the part of the USDA. So land is the basis of all power because it's from land that we get the minerals, that I needed to build modern technological societies. It's on the land that most food is grown, whether it's plant-based food or animals. It's from the land that we get many of our fibers and it's actually on the land that we build communities. And so it's essential that we have access to land. And I say access because the problem, the, the idea of land ownership is a bit problematic. And while I think in the current context we're in, Black people owning land is the only kind of way we can have security in the long term as we're looking at developing our own sovereign societies that are aligned with our own values. The idea of land ownership really is a European construct. We, we can't really own the earth. We didn't create it. We can be guardians of it. We can be stewards of it, but we don't own it. And so in the short term, yes, we should own land. In the long term, we need to be abolishing this whole idea of owning land. Uh, one of the issues that I'm most passionate about 
is the almost colonial style of extraction of wealth from black communities. Food is one of the foundational building blocks of any healthy community, any healthy economy. The economic potential though of black communities throughout the United States is siphoned off either by African-Americans having to leave our communities to gain access to stores in the suburbs that sell high quality merchandise or by spending the money in our communities with people who don't live there, who don't look like us and who don't invest uh, money in the well-being of the communities that are allowing them to make their living. Uh, not much has changed since uh, more than 50 years ago when Malcolm X delivered his famous ballot or the bullet speech in Detroit. And Malcolm said, even when we try and spend our money in the block where we live or the area where we live, we're spending it with the man who when the sun goes down, takes that basket full of money in another part of town. And so we are still faced with the same dilemma today with the extractive economy that rips the resources from our community that we could use to build the infrastructure in our community to be more self-reliant, to have healthy, sane communities. Um, so what about workers in the food system? In the report entitled The Color of Food published in 2011 by the Applied Research Center, it revealed that people of color make less than whites throughout the food chain, including in production, processing, retail, and service and distribution. People of color tend to be concentrated in low wage jobs and hold few management positions in the food system. Access to high quality food is limited in many black communities throughout the United States. In my hometown, Detroit, with a population of roughly 675,000 people, the only national chain grocery in the 139 square mile city is a Whole Foods market that opened in 2014. And clearly Whole Foods is not a solution for most people in the city of Detroit. It's also in the most gentrified area of the city. It's the, the only national chain store to open in Detroit since Farmer Jack closed their last Detroit stores in 2007. And so from 2007 to 2014, there were no national chain groceries in Detroit. Um, according to the Fair Food Network, there's currently about 10 grocery stores for every 100,000 people in Detroit. In Ann Arbor, which is just 40 miles away and much more affluent, there's more than 20 grocery stores for every 100,000 people. Of the 70 or so independently owned grocery stores in Detroit, far too many sell food which is inferior and they lack healthy food options. Even within the burgeoning so-called food movement that seeks to create a more just food system, we see white supremacy rearing its ugly head. Far too often well-funded white nonprofits come into black and Latinx communities to plant gardens, teach cooking and nutrition or lead food justice efforts. While on the surface, such efforts might appear to be noble, those groups far too often approach their work like missionaries, assuming that they know what is best for our communities. The thing about the system of white supremacy is that it's so entrenched in the fabric of American society that none of us escapes it. We all unwittingly play a role in it, uh, whether we are black folks, white folks, or uh, other so-called people of color. So it manifests in different ways. For white people, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it creates the delusion that they are the best thing since sliced bread and that their history, culture, values, worldview, standards of beauty are the universal standards by which everybody else should function. For black people, uh, we experience what we sometimes call internalized racial oppression because of centuries of messaging and actions that suggest our history, culture, and even our bodies have little value. We often have a diminished view of ourselves and that impedes us from collectively working together to address the problems that our communities are faced. So the photo on the left is a so-called uh, Jesus, the person that we've been taught to call Jesus. And I wanna be clear, I'm not attacking anyone's religion. What I am attacking though, is the Europeanized version of Christianity, which has been given to us to make us worship white people and to make us docile. And so central to that kind of Europeanized form of Christianity that's been fed to us has been the imagery that all of us have seen as a child in Bibles and on stained glass windows 
throughout our communities. And in fact, if you ask the average black person to close their eyes and picture Jesus, they're going to see something like this, a white man with long hair, dressed in white, usually with blonde hair and blue eyes. This deeply permeates our psyche. And what it suggests to us is that white people are closer to God, so-called God, which is another European term actually, than we are. And so it diminishes our understanding of our own, divini of our own divinity. Uh, the picture on the right is bleaching cream. And uh, many of our people still despise the skin that we're in. And this is not just a problem with black folks in, in the United States. We see in West Africa, almost an epidemic of black women getting skin cancer because of using bleaching cream in places like Ghana and Nigeria. In Jamaica, which uh, you know, reggae music was one of the bastions of black pride and black self-determination and Pan-Africanism. We now see reggae artists who are talking in their songs about bleaching their skin. And so this is a huge problem, again, if you despise the very skin that you're in. So uh, it takes work to get rid of these internalized notions of white supremacy that we continue to carry with us all the time. And so what, what are these types of things that should be done to try to create a food system which is more just and equitable? So one of the things that we found to be very helpful is um, having groups that address racism in the food system in no uncertain terms. And so in Detroit for about three years, we had a group called Undoing Racism in the Detroit Food System that met monthly. And we had many of the people who were involved in urban agriculture come to these sessions where we talked about white supremacy, help people really understand how race functions in American society. So that now almost any discussion in the city of Detroit about urban agriculture is going to include a discussion about white supremacy. Uh, but also just changing the constructs in our head is not enough. There are actual laws and policies that keep us uh, underdeveloped. And so we need to be working to change those laws and policies while we're moving towards our ultimate goal, which for some of us is nationhood and sovereignty. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip past some of these, except just to say that there's all kinds of food conferences that occur all the time. And at those food conferences, we need to make sure that anybody talking about another, about a food system includes the discussion about white supremacy and how it works so that they can really understand uh, what we need to do to create justice. So one of the things that we have the responsibility to do is to lift up, uh, lift up, identify and support black folks who are leading grassroots food security, food sovereignty and food justice movements in our communities throughout the United States. Uh, organizations and institutions doing work to create a just food system should redouble their efforts to make sure that we have black folks leading this work as heads of organizations, not just as employees, um, people, black folks on boards of nonprofits who are doing this work. And it's imperative that the people who are most impacted by food security and food injustice have the agency to change our conditions rather than us being acted upon by others as if we are subjects. Uh, this is um, uh, Gail Christopher, who used to be vice president of the Kellogg Foundation. And so funders have a role to play also. Fund philanthropy is giving out huge amounts of money. They need to make sure that along with receiving money, that people have to make a commitment to racial equity. And they have a tremendous kind of power because of this money that they're giving to nonprofits throughout the country to really shift the food system if they wanted to do it. So we have the responsibility of shifting the narrative about the food movement. We have to ask ourselves whose voices are heard, whose images are projected. Uh, these are some of the extraordinary food system uh, movement leaders that I think you should know about. This is my sister, Jenga Mwendo, who runs the Backyard Gardeners Network in the Lower Ninth Ward of uh, New Orleans. And she is a native of the no Lower Ninth. Uh, she had gone to New York and was working in the advertising industry. And after Katrina decided to come back and started this organization, not because she's trying to produce huge amounts of food, but because she's using food and gardening as a vehicle to unite people in the community around thinking about what their collective vision is for their neighborhood. And so she's doing incredible work. You definitely need to know about the work of Jenga Mwendo. And of course, uh, participating in the happily nappy, excuse me, that the 
happily natural festival. Yeah, this this weekend is Leah Peniman, uh, who I love and admire so much, who along with her husband runs the Soul Fire Farm in Petersburg, uh, upstate New York. Uh, they are annually doing trainings for black and brown farmers. And of course, she is the author of the book that many of us are recommending, Farming While Black. And finally, in Detroit, this is Jerry Ann Hebron, who runs the Oakland Avenue Farm in Detroit's North End. They've created more than 18 jobs for people in the neighborhood, and they are doing true community-based development. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that within our community, we have all kinds of ways of seeing the world. And so sometimes unity becomes very difficult because of all of these divisions. Um, and so one of the things that unites us is the fact that all of us eat. Again, regardless of your philosophy, regardless of your religion, regardless of your class, regardless of your gender or your gender orientation, all of us eat. And so the reality is that food can become, or the food movement or the struggle to provide a fair and just food in our communities can become a great unifier in our communities. Uh, one of the things, if we're gonna have a fair and just food system that, that should be done is that so-called white people have to learn to humble themselves in order to learn from the rich cultural traditions of black, brown, red, and yellow people. It's my belief that the values embedded in many indigenous cultural traditions are what will pull us from the brink of disaster as a human species. Those active in the struggle for food security, food justice, and food sovereignty must work to dismantle the system of white supremacy if we are to create a food system in which access to high quality, fairly and sustainably grown clean food is upheld as a human right. Uh, the reality is that social justice is a prerequisite for food sovereignty. We're not gonna have food sovereignty without addressing the other inequities that exist in American society. The movement for food sovereignty is not separate from the rest of the black liberation movement. Uh, the great revolutionary thinker, Frantz Fanon, said in his classic book, The Wretched of the Earth, each generation must out of relative obscurity discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Uh, this is our time, and we find ourselves in a unique time with both the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and also the increase in activism that has been spurred by the murder of Black people and the brutalizing and the shooting of Black people throughout the United States. Uh, it's a very uh, a volatile time, but, but a time when we can help to shift people's consciousness. And we're beginning to see already a shift in that consciousness by the tremendous amount of interest that we're seeing in things like urban agriculture, food co-ops, and other self-determination efforts. So people would like to contact me. Uh, that's my email address. You can feel free to write me. And uh, Brother Duran, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. And I think we have time to open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, uh, first of all, before we move into that space, I want to thank you uh, uh, for just you know putting that down, laying down that sound kind of seal over this uh, day's activities. Uh, I mean, I, I think we need clear and cogent uh, articulation of what the problem is in our community. And then, you know, actionable steps towards uh, forward movement. You know, what is it, what, what will it take for us to progress in the most tangible way? You know, there's, there's, there's uh, definitely our consciousness shifting work has to operate lockstep with, you know, uh, real practical applicable practice. So um, thank you for putting that into, uh, in, into words in and in a way that I think everyone that has been tuning in can understand. Um, so I got, uh, I'm gonna look at the, uh, our videos uh, because I got these things posted all over the place and see if we got any questions and if I haven't, uh, gotten any, I want to keep our conversation kind of kind of glowing uh, okay. for the next few minutes. Okay. Um, looks like um, we got some people that are talking on, on our 
YouTube, somebody was talking about uh, food uh, deserts. And um, I, I didn't want to I didn't want to supplant his comment, but I did want to ask if you could help us help folks understand why we don't necessarily want to use the terminology food desert to address, you know, what's happening in terms of people not having access to food or healthy food within uh, within their communities. Um, so I had the misfortune once or maybe the fortune of being on a, a panel with LaDonna Redman in Chicago. LaDonna don't take no prisoners. And hmm. I spoke on the panel before her and I used the term food desert. And she spoke after me and she blasted me. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I respected her for, do it, for doing that. And I, I went up to her afterwards and introduced myself. We'd become friends uh, just because of the guts that she had, really. But I, I want to share with you some of the things she shared with me which have continued to kind of guide my use of that term or my, my lack of use of that term. The, the first thing is that a desert is not really what people think of it as being. A desert is really a very rich ecosystem. It's not some barren place where there's nothing growing. There's all kinds of life in the desert. So that's the first problem with that term. The second problem with the term, which is highly problematic, is that it's another term that's been imposed on our communities by people from the outside. Similarly to uh, sometimes how many of our children are called at-risk children. So I ran an African Center school for 22 years and I never had a person come to me and say, Baba Malik, this is my son Kwame, he's an at-risk child. That is not how we describe our own situation. So similarly with food deserts, this was a term that actually originated in Britain became popularized, be, began to be used somewhat mainly in academic circles. And then in the early part of this century, maybe 2008 or so, a woman out of Chicago named Mari Gallagher did a study in Chicago called Examining the Impact of Food Deserts uh, in Chicago. Then she subsequently did a second study in Detroit. And those studies helped to popularize the use of this term of uh, food desert. Um, so, so those are a couple of reasons that the term is not really the best term. So uh, several people, including my sister Karen Washington, have been advancing the term food apartheid uh, because they feel like it speaks to the intentionality of the lack of equity that exists within the food system. Most people think of a desert as being a natural occurrence, although deserts are also, desertification is also spurred on by human activity, but People think to, tend to think of deserts as being some kind of natural occurrence. And the fact that we don't have access to high quality food in our communities is not some natural occurrence, is a result of policies of implemented over decades that disinvested in black communities. And so food apartheid speaks to the, it speaks to the lack of equity, but it also speaks to the intentionality of this system that denies us access to high quality food. And so, th so thank you for sharing that. You know what I mean? I think what, um, you know, I, I often take time to unpack or try to unpack, you know what I mean? Is that, you know, a lot of this, the, people feel like this stuff is just something that just happened, mm -hmm. like recently as a, you know what I mean? But it's, right. it, but we, we know it has its roots, you know, in, um, in, in policies uh, from, from, uh, the, the, from, I mean, I'll start, I, I like to start in 1950 just because it's like easier for me to navigate with people. And then, you know, I often don't have more than an hour or some change to talk about the stuff. So I'll start there, but we know it goes way back even further. Yeah. Uh, so um, tell us a little bit about some of the work that you all are doing right now in, um, in Detroit. I've, I've been following uh, the, 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 the co-op uh, work that you all have been doing. Can you give us a little briefing on that and what that and why and why that uh, has become central uh, sure. to work? So I mentioned earlier about the extractive economies that function within um, our communities where other folks come open the stores, we come and spend the money, they take the money out of our communities. So one of the first reasons that co-ops are important 
It's because they're owned by what we call the member owners. They're owned by members of the community. And so it's a way of circulating wealth within the community on a more broad basis than can be done if you just had an individual, individually owned membership, uh, sorry, a sole proprietorship or a partnership where one or two people might benefit from the, pro of the profits. In a co-op, multiple people benefit from the profits that are created from the business. The other reason that co-ops are important is because uh, many of us have gotten used to other people making decisions on our behalf. Uh, we become subjects instead of grasping our own agency and making decisions on our own behalf. And so because co-ops are democratic institutions, they force us to grapple with each other and to make decisions about our own collective well-being. Um, so we think for both of those reasons, co-ops are extremely important uh, throughout Black communities throughout the United States. And also, as Sister Jessica Gordon-Nimhart has, has laid out for us exquisitely in her book, Collective Courage, co-ops have been one of the ways that Black people have used to galvanize our collective wealth in an economic system that is hell-bent on excluding us from the mainstream economy. Um, so we're working very hard to one, uh, develop the member owners, the number of member owners of the Detroit People's Food Co-op. And we currently have 1,005 members. Um, we have now surpassed our goal. We want to have 1,000 before the store opens and we'll probably be closer to 2,000 when it opens and we're at least a year out still from the store opening. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're building this building, the Detroit Food Commons, a two-story building. The first floor of the building will be occupied by the co-op. On the second floor, we'll have a community meeting space, four incubator kitchens, and uh, office space where our organization will move. And so we're putting a lot of effort in this. We think it'll be a game changer in Detroit for a number of reasons. One, it pushes back against the white male dominated style of development that we see happening in Detroit. And this is gonna be, by the way, on Detroit's main street. It's not on a side street. It's something people are gonna to have to see every day. Um, but it's also gonna be a game changer for the local growers because uh, we'll have a, a, a central spot that we can sell large amount, we can move large amounts of produce at on a retail level. So it's gonna help spur the urban agriculture movement in the city of Detroit as well. Uh, we continue to operate D-Town Farm. Uh, we've kind of shifted a bit this year because of COVID. So we now have an online ordering system where people can see what we have available each week and order it. And we have contactless curbside pickup where people can pick up their produce. We also this year, uh, shifted uh, because we can't have volunteers at the farm to the same extent that we have had in the past. I mentioned we created a seed sharing program, a video tutorial series, and also we're giving away uh, raised beds and compost so that people can do this in their own yards. Nice, nice, nice. So, 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 so another thing that I noticed or I was paying attention to was uh, the uh, land fund. Yeah. That, that, that work. Um, was very uh, inspirational for me uh, to see take off the ground, come off the ground. Uh, can you give us a little bit of back story on that? A little bit more insight sure. on what that's about? Yeah, so I wanna first say that that effort is led by, uh, by several sisters. Uh, the women are, are like shouldering that work and leading it forward. It was conceived by a sister named Tefira Rushdan, who works for an organization called Keep Growing Detroit. And she's seen the inequity in how white farmers in Detroit are, easy, are able to get easier access to land, are, are, have more capital to purchase that land, and black farmers struggle often for years to do the same thing. And so she conceptualized this idea of the Detroit Black Farmers Land Fund. And so it initially kicked off on Juneteenth Day, and the goal was during that one day to raise $5,000. Well, it went through the charts and we kept doing it and by a week we had more than $50,000. And at this point we have more than $75,000. And so there's been a selection committee and a selection criteria that's been developed to determine uh, which farmers that apply for will actually get pots of money. And uh, there's a caveat in the agreement that if they sell it, they have to sell it to another black farmer. And so we're trying to make sure that we keep this land in black hands in perpetuity. So the uh, Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund is actually a partnership between Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, Keep Growing Detroit, 
and Oakland Avenue Farm, headed by Jerry Hebron, who was in my uh, presentation. Nice, nice. I've been so what um, it's interesting for me because of the work that we've been doing here in uh, Virginia and Richmond in particular. Um, I uh, I think I told you before I, that I've, I've been serving on the the, the uh, community land trust, a local community land trust here. Um, I'm about two years uh, on the board in there, and I was brought on specifically uh, because of the work that we did with Urban Ag and to try to help them identify parcels of land that could be used for that purpose. But what has happened over the last year has uh, has I've been taking down this path of analysis about uh, collective community ownership of land versus, um, you know, uh, in all in, in all transparency, like having real real significant struggles with worry around um, a community, well, individuals owning land, and then you know, them as a result of them owning land as individuals, like what kind of uh, precarious position they, they get placed in by just being an individual that owns land yeah. versus being surrounded by a collective, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how, uh, I don't know if, if anybody's wrestling with that. Yes. Or, um, it's yes. something that, that's been on my mind, of, you know, tax, you know, people paying taxes on the land one being like a concern, like what does that happen if folks get behind on the taxes? You know, if someone farms unsuccessfully on the land, you know, what kind of, you know, what, what kind of safeguards do we have to keep it from going back into a speculative market, you know what I mean? Or having some white developer come scoop it up, yeah. you know what I'm saying, from underneath uh, uh, a farmer to just say, hey, you know, I, I, I thought I could do this. Uh, turns out I can't. I'm not really interested in it anymore. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that, that, that type of space. And then the other thing that's really been turning me uh, sideways and really be, making me dig deep is um, the capacity for affordable housing to operate in tandem with you know what I mean? The the land acquisition. You know what I mean? They're just thinking about people like Shirley Sherrod, you know what I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, the folks over in uh Cooperation Jackson over in Mississippi, and just trying to make it make it so it's like, all right, we kind of come at this with a or at least try to figure out how to come at this from a from a holistic standpoint and seeing, well, you know, at the same time that we need affordable housing, we need you know, public community space, we need control of the food system. So how do we, you know, how do we, how do we move, you know, with, with, with intentionality around addressing, you know, both of those needs, you know what I mean? In, in the community, because I know in the urban space, the sacrifice for urban farms or urban green space is, you know, this idea of what well, we're going to build a house on here. You know what I mean? It's like, there's not enough land. I know. I know Detroit doesn't have the same kind of uh, conditions as, as 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 some other places, but um, I'm sure that that might be something that's also on people's on on people's hearts and thoughts as 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 this work evolves. Yeah. So for sure, the community land trust uh, idea has been definitely part of the discussion with the Detroit Black Farmers Land Fund, and I think uh, probably all of us agree with you that the community land trust is a superior model to individual ownership of land. But I think the sister doing this wanted to move it quickly. Oh, yeah. uh, sometimes putting these mechanisms in place can take years Certainly. to create a community land trust. And there's some opportunities now that five years from now may not exist. Exactly. So you want to move the ball quickly, but there is some discussion about even how perhaps later in the process, uh, the land purchased by individual farmers can be put in a collective trust but definitely that's a superior model. You know, yeah. the thing about it is the root, the laws regarding land trust are not uniform throughout the country. And so yeah, in some that's cases true. it may work really well. In some cases it may be only a partial safeguard. I'm curious as to also in Detroit, like, you know, what's, uh, what's the conversation about like in, in Richmond and Virginia or in, in the Richmond region, 
there's often this kind of like either or dichotomy between rural versus urban land, right? Mm -hmm. And you're often thrust into this kind of like poverty pit of, okay, we got to do rural, you know, because there's not enough money to do rural and urban. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't feel that way. I feel like it's both uh, necessary land wherever is of critical importance in that, you know, rural feeds into urban and urban should feed into rural. But what, what are some of the conditions like in Detroit, you know, as it relates to that, you know, that push and pull? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we definitely, you know, there's people here who are definitely looking at how we buy land outside of the city. There's definitely some efforts underway. In fact, I'm pushing the organization I lead in that direction um, to get some larger acreage that we can really do larger scale production. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the challenge with that is that once you buy the land, you got to have somebody on it all the time. You can't, you know, you can't be a part-time farmer and go to it once a week or whatever. Right. And so either you have to move to the land, uh, which means that you have to have certain things in place right. for your protection, because often in rural areas you have, right. Uh, right. You, know, you got racist whites mm. who want to uh, run folks out right, or harass people. So you have to be on the sure security. Uh, but then also for people who've grown up in a city, you know, it's a change to, to now move into a rural area where you, you know, you're not going to go to the club at night or, right. you know, you know <laughs> the kind of social life that you might be used to that exists in a city doesn't exist in the rural areas. And so right. we need people who are ready to make that shift in their thinking and their lifestyle to live on land if we're going to be purchasing land in rural areas. Um, so it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I think right now for most of us, the urban farming is easier and it's kind of a way of getting our feet wet and learning what's involved in farming and we can do it closer to where we live so we don't have to worry about either transporting stuff, you know, you know, 40, 50 miles outside of the city or whatever the case may be. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, like the way it works is that, you know, if we could develop homes, you know, and like you said, security for those homes you know, in rural areas, uh, because I mean, you know, anybody that's that that's advocating for a move for rural, for, for black people into rural areas at this moment, with all of this ish that's going on right now with the Boogaloo boys and the white supremacists and all that type of stuff, you're outnumbered in the rural area. That's That, that was the shit that took us to the city and, you know, 50 years or 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. But, um, you know, I know that rural farmers definitely need uh, the plug, need to be able to plug in to, you know, the urban core because that's where all their, that's where the majority of the sales would go. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're talking about, yeah. you yeah. know, supply chains, you know what I mean? If you go, if you're going to grow on five, six acres of land, you know, 40 miles outside of the city, then where are you selling? Right you know, that, that amount, that amount of uh, poundage, you know what I mean? And, and, and how much does it cost you to transport it and to go back and forth between? So all, all those things, you know, uh, somebody said, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. I think that was too short. I don't know. That was Tanisio too. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so, you know, but there's an economic equation to this thing. Cause if you're spending more on transportation, then you're intaking from the sale of the food, then it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So we yeah. got to figure out all those logistics. But I mean, definitely, we need to be trying to see how we're doing this in cities and in rural areas, for sure. For sure, for sure. Um, and, and as you said, looking at how we build intentional communities. How do we build housing? And you know, right. you know, farming is just one part of this larger equation. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, you, what, you got any other things that y'all are working on right now that um, might might that you might want to share about? We're at, uh, we're at seven, I, so I want to. I mean, I know I, we I said we were going to. I think those are really the main things that I've mentioned already. Uh, mm -hmm. I would I would like to say something about the band I played. If I, I was about to say, I was like, I was trying to set you up for the for the for the volley, bro. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay I caught it before you threw it. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so I lead a band in Detroit called Molly Wop. And, um, you know, for many years I played in reggae bands and I think most people in Detroit probably identify me as a reggae musician. But, uh, you know, I realized several years ago that although I love reggae, 
and I love the message of reggae. I also love funk and I love jazz mm. and I love r and I love hip hop and right. all of these have been influences in my life. And so I don't think I should have to like choose one over the other. And so in some ways, Molly Wop is a genre defying band that incorporates several of these elements of music that you know we grew up with and loved here in the city of Detroit. And it's also a multi-generational band. Uh, I'm 64 years old and then we have probably the youngest members about 27 and we have various ages in between. And we also have folks who have different belief systems inside the band. Uh, myself and the other elder brother in the band, Ayo Dele, who's the leader of the vocal section, who by the way, used to sing with, with the dramatics. Uh, you know, we're in our sixties and we're like staunch Pan-Africanists. We have one brother in the band who says he's indigenous and he wears Native American headdresses. Uh, you know, that's not how I identify, that's how he identifies, but we found a way to work together and to create a common bond. So in a sense, we think Molly Wap is kind of like a microcosm of the unity that we need across, uh, across divisions within our community. And it all, you know, it works out. We make this slamming music. You know, we do, we can, we can play reggae with the best of them. And we can also break into some funk and some rock and we can break into some soulful vocal harmony. So, you know, we're trying to cover the gamut. So I'm gonna take, so, um... I'm going I'm to I'm 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 take a moment right here, right? And I'm going to say, you know, I'm super excited to show the Happily Natural Day family the new video that came out a couple of weeks ago from Molly Wap. That's new to the new joint called Shake. Am I right? Is this, is this you're right. You're right. You, you, want, you want to tell me something about this, well, about this new joint? So the first thing I'll say is this, that I'm learning how to write songs that are less direct. Uh, in the past, most things I wrote were like very to the point. It was very clear what it was about. I'm learning how to write things now that sometimes are more obscure mm -hmm. and you have to really think about it and you have to really, uh, you know, kind of dig a little bit deeper to really get what the song is about. So some people might think this song is about shaking your booty, but it's not about that at all. I'll just, I'll just say that. All right, well, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to throw it to this video. We're going to come back. Uh, we had to, we're here at the 18th Annual Happily Natural Day premiering uh, Molly Wap and the new joint that they got called Shake. Yeah, I said, hold on, let me see what we got. So no audio. No audio. No audio. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm gonna run it back. That ain't right. That ain't supposed to be the case. Let me see. Hold on. Uh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Now just hit play. We should be good to go. You hear now? Yep. Oh no, we still don't hear. Hold uh, on, let me see. I, I think I did something on my sharing. Hold on, y'all. I got to get this to y'all real quick. This is going to be the hit because I, I was I was jamming off this joint earlier myself. Hold on a second. Ah. Or, or if you give me screen sharing, I got it pulled up too. Oh, okay. All right, you go ahead and do it. Okay, all right, boom. Yeah, go ahead Go ahead. and do, uh, do the thing. Okay, is my screen up now? Yeah, your screen up. Okay, you can see it? Hold up. No, no, no. Hold up. Yeah, you should be able to share now. Okay, just a minute. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Thank you. 
Thank you, bro. Yes, because we can have fun, man. It's not. It's not that we can have music with a message. We ain't got all of like, you know, super steel face grins <laughs> in the midst of in the midst of it all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, brother. I appreciate it, man. So Thank let me say, we got a whole album I call "Stand Up." <laughs> Oh, good. Uh, Nas jumped on my timeline some kind of way. Hey, look, we ultra black over here. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we got a whole album out called Stand Up, and it's on uh, all the streaming services, but it's also on YouTube. People can listen to the whole album uh, for free on YouTube. And, you know, that's one of our, that's one of the lighter songs, really. Most of our songs have a much more kind of hardcore political message. Uh, but we're still trying to do it in a way that's fun and where people don't feel like they're being preached to and just get turned off. So I, I would encourage people to check out the whole album, Molly Wop, with the excl exclamation point at the end of it. And the album is called Stand Up. And, and you said it's on all streaming media too? Yes, sir. Okay, fire. Yes. So how can people connect with you after, you know, tonight? You know, I got people, there's people on YouTube, there's people on Twitter, there's people on Facebook, like what are, uh, what, are, what are the ways that people can stay in communion uh, with the work that you're doing? Uh, well, I'm putting my email address in the uh, chat box for those who can see that. But for those who can't see it, you can contact me uh, via the Detroit Black Community 
Food Security Network's website, which is www.dbcfsn.org, dbcfsn.org. Uh, that's probably the best way. I also give out my email address if people want to contact me directly. And that's my first and last name, M-A-L-I-K-Y-A-K-I-N-I at gmail.com. M-A-L-I-K-Y-A-K-I-N-I at gmail.com. Oh. So, um, yo, I'm, I'm just going to I'm gonna go ahead and say, hey, man, thank you for, thank for, you. for rocking with us tonight, man. This yeah. is... Uh, this is this has been a beautiful moment, man. I'm really appreciative of the energy, and and, and you know we documenting this, and so we're gonna be replaying it tomorrow uh, as well. So it's gonna be a good way for you know people to use their Sunday. You know this is a heavy weekend. You had the Demo the Black Democratic Convention with Black Lives Matter on yesterday. You know what I mean. You had the March on Washington with Al and his and his posse. Mm -hmm. on yesterday too so people and then you know rest in power we have uh brother chadwick bozeman to pass away last night so people are really in a more in, in a moment so we're going to be utilizing today's you know programming to kind of like hey you know let's move man this is where this is where it's at health and wellness you know community land ownership you know what i mean food justice you know sovereignty this is where we're at this is this is where we can get our hands dirty and i appreciate you for being a part of this moment I appreciate you for your leadership and all the work you've been doing. And I've been following you on Facebook also and admiring, uh, you know, the work you've been doing on behalf of the community with the raised beds and, you know, looking at the dilemma with the lumber and all of that. So, Crazy. so you know, your work is not going unnoticed either. Right. Give thanks, brother. I'm thankful to be in the room, just to be a part of the multiple multitude. We doing this, man. And yes, sir. I'm honored to be a part of, part of the work. It's so, a week day. It's a thing. So check it out. We get ready to turn wind up, you know, not wind down. Uh, we're gonna throw some music. We got some music, you know what I mean? My brother Tanisio, brother DJ Third World, who's gonna be spinning some tunes uh into the evening for us. So um what I wanna say, you know, just in terms of all those who are watching right now, you know what I mean? I wanna tell you all how much I appreciate all of you all for tuning in to the 18th annual Happily Natural Day, 18 years. This festival is older than my children. So I wanna thank you for tuning in. Everybody that's been sharing the links, everybody that's been tuned in, whether it was on the website or on the YouTube or the Twitter or the Facebook, thank you for uh, staying tuned in, even with the glitches. It's the first time we ever did it like this. Um, and you know, you all supporting this work is what makes this work work. And so that's, this is a this is a what we call a participatory education. You know what I mean? Everybody's in this together. I don't know more than him. He don't know more than me. We all trying to figure out and practice a theory that using you know education, using information, we can give our people information so that we can you know move on you know liberation in our in, in our lifetime not something talking no, we're not talking about you know 70 years from now we're talking about what can we do right now to move the needle forward and happily natural day is a platform for that you know we got information all on the website on urban farming culinary arts is books you know free stuff you can check it out uh, pull it down. There's videos, tutorials on how to do this urban ag stuff, on how to do sustainable farming, rural farming, wherever you at, composting, aquaponics, everything. We try to put it all in one space where you can search it and put it in practice right now, like tomorrow in your own community. So thank you all for being a part of that work. Um, you know, we're going to rebroadcast a lot of these presentations over the next couple of weeks. So definitely help share that as well. If you want to make a donation to Happily Natural Day, you can do that on the website as well. Um, thank you for everybody that's been supporting the Resiliency Garden Project. We raised over $65,000 in the last two months with that. And cumulative, since we turned Happily Natural Day into a nonprofit, we raised over $100,000 in five months. And so that is a testament to the power of community. This wasn't like a whole bunch of grants that we got. This was you 
donating five dollars, you donating twenty, you donating a hundred. You know what I mean? Getting that random six hundred, five thousand dollars in the kitty for us to do this work in community is really what cooperative and economics and collective work and responsibility looks like.